Welcome back to K3 Real Estate Live UK, a week-long programme of events brought to you by White Label and our partners. This week is the first of three events this year, with the second in June and the third in October, as we continue to promote the strengths and opportunities of places across the UK. Uh, the programme seeks to keep the property and regeneration sector updated and engaged, and the fantastic programme of events that we've had so far this week, and still yet to come, uh, have been doing just that. You can view more details on the sessions taking place uh, on our website, realestatelive.co.uk, and I'll let you know more about others taking place later this week at the end of the session. Uh, before we begin this session, uh, Ealing's Green Homes, which is being hosted in partnership with Greystar and Ealing in London, we will be launching a short poll. What will be the most significant trend for regeneration professionals in 2021? Uh, there are a few options now on your screen, so uh, please take your time to read through them and submit your answer. We will be taking the answers uh, away and uh, compiling them and sharing them at the end of the week. Uh, while you're uh, taking a few minutes just to answer the, the questions, um, please uh, don't forget we do have a Q&A function. So uh, don't, uh, submit your questions through that function and uh, we will get them answered by our panel uh, today. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce you to the chair of this panel, Pat Brown, Director of Central. Over to you, Pat. Thank you very much, Callum, and, and welcome from me, everybody, to this really important session looking at um, Ealing's Green Homes, which is brought to you in partnership with Greystar and Ealing in London. And now we're going to talk about a topic which is so important, which is how we respond to the climate emergency, which is absolutely fundamental. And many of us all have been listening or reading um, the book that's just recently been produced by Bill Gates, which has set out in very sort of good layman's terms, the challenge ahead of us, but also how we can address this. And today's panel is going to talk about the um, some of the really important work that is going on in in West London and Ealing especially in, in particular uh, to actually help us get to where we need to as quickly as possible. Now London boroughs, not, not just Ealing, housing providers and developers are working through the, the imperative to address the issues of climate change. And also simultaneously considering what the homes of tomorrow will need to offer to their residents. And that is, you know, that's a very complex sort of mix of all sorts of things, in, including creating the green space, but also the sort of the urban um, the urban infrastructure that will help us respond and be future proofed. Um, and in Ealing itself, in the London Borough of Ealing, they have produced their own economic recovery uh, strategy which responds to the pandemic but also pulls in many of the ambitions that Ealing has had for quite some time. I've been working alongside Ealing for a long time and know this is at the heart of their thinking for, for several years now. And the green print document lays the foundations and what future economic growth strategy will look and feel like for, for Ealing, for the people of Ealing. One that is co-developed, and this is critical in collaboration with the many stakeholders across the boroughs, and we'll talk about the importance of collaboration throughout this, and the investors that underpin making that happen, all with a view of, of making, uh, improving the health and well-being and prosperity of Ealing residents. Now, Ealing also led West London, the West London Borough's bid to secure um, nearly £5 million of Green Homes grant, which we'll hear about later, from government. And they are now implementing a raft of, of retrofit programmes to put that green infrastructure and low zero carbon um, building into buildings and invest in active travel. So they're doing this in partnership uh, and we'll be hearing from one of the developers uh, at least who is actually helping create this in partnership with Ealing, looking at modern methods of construction and sustainable energy provision, such as uh, Grey Star's exemplary Green for Key development, um, more of which later. Um, so now we're going to go on and hear about how Ealing Council, uh, Grey Star, and its partners are working together 
to ensure that their homes and their neighborhoods are truly sustainable and offer a good quality of life for people of all incomes um, in, in, the, in the borough. Now, uh, in a moment, we'll be hearing from Joanna Mortison, uh, who, who we followed, who's a climate action program manager in Ealing. She'll be followed by Philip Brown, who's the director of housing development uh, at London Borough of Ealing as well. That will be, they will be followed by Paul Fanning from the development manager from Greystar Europe. And then Richard Foxley follows Paul. He's the senior associate of HTA Design. And last but absolutely not least is Emma Fletcher, who's director of the Hill Group. So without further ado, I'd now like Joanna to take the stage, please. Over to you, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today, uh, representing uh, Ealing Council. As Pat said, I'm the Climate Action Program Manager for the Council, and we've spent the last year creating a strategy around our ambition to become net zero uh, by 2030 as a borough. So quite a, a lofty goal, but uh, one that we feel like we have the right tools to put together um, a great response with the help of partners and especially our, our community organizations to deliver on that ambition. Um, in terms of homes, uh, homes represent 40% of the carbon emissions in the borough right now, um, energy use in our homes. So we think that it's an enormous opportunity for us to make gains there. Um, and we think that this is uh, particularly important for the retrofit of the existing buildings, but also uh, for the new builds that are coming through, obviously. Um, we, we know that our homes have the opportunity to help us with mitigating climate change and adapting to the impacts that we're already experiencing, but also maybe even more importantly, making sure that the health of our residents is protected uh, by, by building and, and retrofitting homes so that they're at a high standard that, that everyone can, can thrive in. Um, and we also have a particular influence, uh, uh, emphasis on our most disadvantaged and most vulnerable communities, which is where our, our green print for recovery comes in, which has recently been, been launched and we're consulting on that with our stakeholders now to make sure that we've got all of the principles of our uh, economic recovery and not just our economic recovery, but making sure that, as I said, climate action and health are sort of at the heart of that. Um, as, as Pat said in my introduction, we recently led on the bid to secure about £5 million from central government to, to proceed with retrofitting, the long overdue task of retrofitting, really. Um, and so we've, we've led seven boroughs towards uh, a program of doing a deep whole house retrofit of homes for our most vulnerable residents, um, which is really exciting. And we've got some really great gains in terms of um, employment opportunities coming through there, but also most importantly, as I said, making sure that we're making uh, excellent homes for our residents to reside in into the future. Um, and we have the ambition to improve these homes to bring forward the local employment opportunities as well um, through the delivery of that program. Uh, so five million pounds is a great win for us and we're, we're hugely excited and grateful to have that, that amount of, of, of grant to work with and put this program together. But in reality, that, that five million pounds will deliver about 700 retrofits uh, to, to homes in the seven boroughs. So it's just a, a skim of actually what needs to be done. And the, the data that we have shows us that um, of the just over 600,000 homes that are in our, our West London catchment area, about 200,000, so a third of those, actually perform at a, a really low level of in terms of energy performance. And, and that also equates to not only the energy use, but how much people are needing to spend on their energy bills. Um, so about a third of those um, those homes fall into what's called a, a D, D, E, F, or G category. And those can be brought into a C category, which is, you know, a, a decent average for us to, to be getting into. And so that's really the, the big look at the ambition or, or what we need to be ambitious about. Um, so looking at 200,000 homes that, that still will need to be retrofit over the course of the next decades. Um, and so that's a, as you can, you can get the sense of that magnitude, uh, that's going to keep us busy for a very long time and, and, and is an enormous challenge for a number of reasons. Um, but we hope that, that 
the, the program that we're delivering now will help us sort of set the pace for this delivery and um, help us create solutions that we can we can take up quickly and um, find accept, acceptable retrofit solutions for all of those properties. We also know that the new homes coming through play a huge part in delivering on our uh, carbon neutral agenda. Um, and there's really no sense in making a tremendous effort on the retrofit end of things while we continue to fill the pipeline with homes that will need to be retrofit in 20 years. So our own uh, housing delivery um, uh, partners, our own housing delivery organization within the council, Broadway Living, will be speaking in a moment about the ambitions that we're setting internally, the leadership aspect of that. And um, some of our partners on the, on the program later will be talking about how they're delivering through their own own um, developments that they're bringing forward. And I know that we'll see in our own policies through the, the London plan broadly, but then also how uh, what policies we're aiming to create through our own local plan to really reinforce that all of the projects that come forward and, and create new homes really need to align with this ambition of zero carbon, not just in spirit, but also in practical delivery. Thanks, Pat. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. I'd now like to bring Philip to the stage and do feel free all of the other panelists to put your cameras on at this point, please, if you if you wish. Philip, over to you. I believe you've got a presentation to show us as well. So look forward to that. <laughs> thanks, Pat, and thanks, Joe. Uh, I am Philip Brown and currently Director of Housing Development at Ealing and Managing Director Designate for Broadway Living. Uh, which is, for those of you that don't know, Ealing's wholly owned local housing company set up to deliver its vision, which is to provide high quality, sustainable, affordable homes for Ealing's communities. And uh, great progress so far. We, um, while we share Ealing's civic values, we are a unique blend of social responsibility, community values and more importantly, community and uh, commercial ambition. And uh, supporting this, we have just recently approved our business plan, which is to deliver over 1,500 homes with uh, support from lending from Ealing and also grant from GLA. And our ambition is to add 500 homes a year to that program from 22-23. And as I said, a great start because our first 300 homes are going on site in March this year, uh, which is fantastic from a, a delivery perspective. And, and supporting our program, we have developed a development guide. Uh, this is interim, an interim guide at this moment because it hasn't yet been formally approved, although the, the Broadway Living Board has obviously been in, uh, uh, involved in developing this guide and bringing it to the state it's at now. It's a live document, so it will be constantly refreshed. Um, and it's been put together with consultation across a wide range of stakeholders in the borough and externally, including technical and professional consultants and other stakeholders. Um, and it has key themes. So if we can go to the next slide. Whoever's controlling the slides, thank you very much. And the key themes are, are set out here. It's, uh, its focus is on sustainability, healthy homes and affordability. And um, in delivering our program, Broadway Living will really want to be focusing on ensuring that we, we meet as many of these uh, key themes as possible. It is of course aspirational and it may not be possible in all cases to meet all of the objectives, but uh, we aim to uh, improve our performance against the objectives over time and, of course, review the live document as we learn more from our development programme and how we could improve uh, our ability to meet the objectives. The document itself is set out in a series of chapters uh, and the key headings in the chapters are sustainable homes, clearly, Health and well-being is a second chapter. And the third is affordable homes for diverse communities. And the fourth is design and construction quality. Within each of those main chapters, we have a number of objectives set out. Uh, we're not being too prescriptive with the objectives. So in uh, chapter one, sustainable homes, 
The objectives are around life cycle carbon assessment, the circular economy, net zero carbon in use. And the fourth objective is the next slide, please. Passive house, you can see it's the top one on the left hand side. So what we're saying here is that um, our intention for this objective is for a passive house certified designer to be appointed early on and to input into the uh, project from early stage. And we want to use the passive house planning package as much as possible and also develop a passive house report to accompany the energy report for the planning application. And then for a final passive house report to be signed off before completion. Now, it is more expensive, we recognize that, and we have allowed for the additional costs in our business plan to deliver the 1500 homes. Not every home will be delivered to passive house standard because it's just not practical on some sites. And the first 300 that should be starting on site in March do include a number of smaller sites. There are some larger sites there as well, but a number of smaller sites where there are some challenges in terms of meeting um, passive house standard on the particular with the particular constraints. Um, but the, the schemes that are starting have all been tendered and uh, are ready to uh, ready to go effectively, delivering passive house on as many of those as as possible. Um, on this slide, you can see the four objectives in the first chapter, and the first chapter is sustainable homes. So I've talked about passive house, zero operational carbon is uh, is critical as well, and we will be using the GLA's 2020 zero carbon standard to reference against this. We also want to undertake life cycle carbon assessments. And we are very keen on uh, encouraging the local circular economy. This was mentioned by uh, Pat at the beginning in terms of our evening's green print. Uh, and one, one, obta one objective there, of course, is to encourage inward investment and business growth. And we think the circular economy through this uh, process will certainly help to contribute to that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things we're focusing on in the, in the design, in the design guide is nature. And so we are, uh, have an objective to deliver healthy outdoor spaces. We are also uh, looking at encouraging ecology and biodiversity as far as possible. Uh, clean air is very important too, and then healthy internal spaces. These uh, objectives are spread across different uh, chapters in the, in the details in the guide itself. Uh, next slide, please. Another focus is travel. And uh, we want to encourage walking and cycling as much as possible and uh, reduced use of cars where possible. And of course, uh, where cars are used to encourage uh, electric cars. And so we would be looking at future proofing developments for installation of electric charging points. We want to develop car free areas uh, low carbon streets and active travel infrastructure. And you will ask, I guess, how a small scheme can capture all these things. Well, um, yes, good question. But this is about integrating our proposals into the, the wider urban fabric and working with adjoining landowners and the local authority Ealing to attempt to establish these uh, principles across more than just the site itself, but beyond the site and uh, to be um, encouraging these objectives where possible in a wider area. I believe there's another slide. You need to, okay, it's just Sorry. at the end. So the end, there we go, perfect timing. Fantastic, thank you very much. And there's a lot to unpack in that conversation. So I'd now like to introduce Paul Fanning, who's Development Manager of Graystar, over to you, Paul. Hi, um, so um, Greystar, um, we are looking to support Aileen's green agenda, ensuring uh, homes are sustainable, affordable, and flexible to future trends. Um, in case you don't know Greenford, uh, Greenford Key, the site is a 26 acre site. Uh, we are providing over uh, 2,100 
and 18 homes across nine buildings um, and uh, providing a, a new landscaped area. Um, so the scheme, we are predominantly a build to rent developer. Um, there are four build to rent schemes, uh, but one of the key objectives for us was to provide uh, a mixed and balanced community, um, offering a, a full range of affordable tenures um, to, to ensure you know, our site and our buildings are available to as many people as possible. Um, in, with uh, a dedicated uh, affordable block, we also have uh, affordable within our built to end scheme. So um, it's inclusive, those people can avail of the Grace Star uh, service of our amenity provision and all of the experience that our other residents get. Um, and then flexibility is another key factor for us, um, especially with the last year and COVID um, and the implications of that. Um, we see space as, as one of the key um, criteria for our residents. Um, our apartments are generally over 10% larger than the space standards on average. Uh, and we want to um, we include uh, lots of storage um, within the apartments, including some uh, supplementary storage in the building for larger items such as surfboards. Um, and, you know, we own and we operate our buildings. So we ensure there are refurbishment plans uh, just to ensure that the buildings themselves, um, uh, you know, go with the trends, but also can capture any changes and, and any improvements that can occur uh, in the next sort of coming years. Uh, but one of the, the, the key tenets, I suppose, of our design is, is sustainability. It's at the forefront of what we do. Um, we are at the vanguard of uh, volumetric modular construction. Uh, so Tillerman's Court, the first live building uh, at Greenford Quay, uh, was constructed through uh, volumetric modular uh, construction. Um, it was completed in... Um, you know, uh, 19 months uh, with the first units to, from a spade in the ground until the first resident moving in was uh, 15 months, which uh, is a superb improvement upon uh, traditional means. Um, and it means there's less traffic on the roads. There are less construction workers on site, which with COVID, you know, this modular is, is, is amazing in terms of ensuring social distancing. Um, and it, it reduces CO2 substantially. Um, we've worked out that Tillerman's Court saves 26,000 tonnes of CO2 over the building's lifespan, um, which is um, a huge amount. It's equivalent to over 260,000 trees being planted. Um, so all in all, uh, you know, Green for Key, it's all about sustainability and uh, we're very proud of the development thus far. Super, thank you very much. And now we'll go over to Emma Fletcher from Hill. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Pat. Um, for many of you who don't know Hill, we were set up just over 21 years ago, actually on the back of MMC. And things are obviously moving forward uh, in terms of design and where we go further forward uh, in the future. For us, uh, sustainability is key to everything we do. And we've been really looking at how we're going to hit the targets to achieve many of the 2030 targets that have been set by both the councils locally, the boroughs, and also government, and to ensure that actually the homes are fit for purpose in the future. Uh, back in 2018, we completed what was, I don't know whether it still is, the largest passive house scheme at Agar Grove for Camden, uh, which was 345 homes. And since then, we've actually learned a lot about how we can take that project forward. We've worked on a number of small sites across Ealing, looking at how we can adapt to new mo modern methods of construction construction and how we can actually integrate new homes into the existing communities. Um, for us, we see this now as a much wider ecosystem, possibly something that developers didn't do before. So it's not actually just the building of the homes, it's how they set in place and actually the cost to run in the future. 
So we're very excited to actually be thinking about all these wider issues um, and also things like food security as well. Um, one of the parts of uh, the company Hill has been working in agri-tech. And we've learned an awful lot about actually uh, food production and food waste. And that is something we're looking to integrate into our developments in the future, looking at actually how people buy food and actually uh, use it and then what they do with the waste as well. And taking some of our other thoughts in terms of sustainable living, in terms of uh, cycle provision, what families need in terms of moving forward, be it cargo bikes, which are bigger than traditional bikes, through to how they get their deliveries as well. So for us, it's quite an exciting time to be looking to the future. But one of the things we've really learned, it's a, it's a far bigger than a site by site basis. And actually having that bigger vision and how you integrate all these sites is key. Um, on MMC, we have developed a product for the homeless and we've been talking with citizens in Southall already about how we integrate our modular home for the homeless into the borough. And so there are some very exciting times ahead, um, but it really is going to be a full partnership working scenario in order to bring all of these sites forward and actually be ready and prepared. And uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, retrofit as well is also key to this uh, wider project across the borough um, and actually getting temperatures high enough to retrofit into existing homes to minimise disruption. So that for us is a really exciting uh, project to actually you know, look at as well as to how new developments can integrate with the old, but also bring them up to uh, modern standards as well. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. And, and absolutely, uh, last but not least, we've got um, Richard Foxley, who's Senior Associate from HTA, over to you. And we're going to hear about the design side of this now, aren't we? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so HTA Design are a, a multidisciplinary practice. So we're not just architects, we're uh, architects, landscape architects, sustainability consultants, uh, and a whole range of other disciplines that um, have we've deliberately collected all these people together because we think you need all these sort of different ideas uh, and all the different input to make a great place. Um, and the, the sort of the sustainability aspect and the, the climate challenge is something we've been interested in for quite a while now um, and isn't is specifically a particularly new thing for us. Um, so the, the, sort of the most recent developments aren't particularly um, influencing the, the front end of our design because we've been interested in that for quite a while. But what we are trying to do now is work with uh, the clients and the design teams that we work as uh, part of um, and sort of educate people on the benefits of committing to a sustainable approach to design. So as a practice, we've signed up to the Reba 2030 Climate Challenge uh, and we're pioneering initiatives like uh, home performance labelling, which are designed to give uh, a bit information back to end users and purchasers about what they're taking on. Um, so it empowers them and we're looking to change the terms of our uh, appointments with our clients so that it includes things like post-occupancy post evaluation um, and design stage embodied energy assessments. So that can illustrate to everyone the, the benefit of the sustainable approach to um, the development, to the building, to placemaking as a whole. Um, and it changes the conversation from just being about the sort of capital expenditure considerations at the start to being more about the sort of the whole life cycle, the, um, the embodied energy that goes into running the developments. Um, like Joanne was talking about before, the retrofitting, you know, can we extend the life of buildings? Can we make it easier to retrofit them? Or indeed, when it does come to the end of the building life, you know, can we make it easier to demolish them or reuse uh, some of the materials? And um, so these are all the things that we're trying to do uh, to take that um, knowledge and feed it back into the start of our design process. So our design, um, the, the arguments that we make are based on more and more on empirical evidence. So it's, you know, it's less about uh, someone's opinion and it is actually sort of the evidence there. So um, as Paul mentioned earlier, um, we were the... Uh, the master planning and delivery architects and landscape architects for the Green for Key development. Um, so on the, the design stage of the first building that we developed, um, we actually went through the process of modeling the building in its entirety in two separate forms, one under traditional construction and one using modular construction. Um, and that uh, the whole life cycle was taken into consideration and it showed the, the improvement in embodied energy not just in creating the building, but running it and the end of life. 
Um, and that quite quickly, when you have investors like Greystar who are there for the long term and they're not just there to sell on and walk away, um, they are really interested in that. And it's that sort of thing that makes places attractive to people. Um, with you know the committing to that sustainability approach actually leads to a better human experience in the long run. Um, but it's you know traditionally up to this point been sort of hard to convince many developers of that because they've not necessarily been in for the, the long run. But and um, more and more uh, the developers are switching on to the difference that uh, that can make. So that's what we're doing at the moment and working collaboratively with uh, the councils, with design teams, with clients, as I say, is uh, sort of paramount for us. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I know that the, there's already an audience Q&A, but I just want to pick a few things up, if I may, because there's a lot in there. And, um, you know, we heard about the importance of integration into the wider place and in different ways. This, this is an ecosystem, the importance of vision. And I, I want to come back to that in a moment. Uh, the idea of post-occupancy evaluation is so fundamental, but actually, you know, Greystar built to rents is a constant post-occupancy evaluation that I would suggest, you know, because you don't get tenants if they, you don't keep tenants if they don't like living there. And that's one of the beauties, I think, of, of, of build to rent and the urgency and the scale of the retrofit program, which, you know, Joe highlighted amongst many other pearls of wisdom we've just heard, you know, We've got in London, we've got 1500 square kilometers of London. That's one thing that is a given. Um, so we've got this infinite amount of space. And there's even though we might, you know, some people say that the population is declining because of the pandemic. We have got a lot of people who want to live here and different needs. So in all of that, you know, how do we actually um scale up on what we're talking about here because this is a beautiful partnership that we we have assembled of enlightened people who are doing good stuff how do we scale that um while we can meet the density and quality in design yet meet the public health needs of of the people who live here it says occupants on my question but let's talk about people um and uh, particularly making sure that they do have we all have to have access to the green space that you know we heard from Greystar is absolutely such a vital part you know so so the question is how how do we fit all of these things in um in this infinite space this finite space um, and take it out to a, 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 not just London, because this is a, an urban issue. Do you want to kick off, Emma? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, thanks, Pat. So um, to anybody who knows me knows um, my poor village gets a lot of my abuse in terms of trying out all my batty ideas. Uh, I, I live on uh, in a home with oil and so um, also very worried about community. So things like community land trust we set up a community land trust and uh, in the village and that has been fantastic and they can be set up in urban areas as well in terms of empowering people to come up with good ideas because i think actually it's the ideas that we need to harvest because there are some fantastic things out there and it's how do you get that up from the grassroots so um i think that's key but i also see things on a 3d level every bit of new infrastructure should work on many levels for every cycle path that we put in we should be laying district heating pipes for every bit of water we should be looking at could we float solar on it could we be growing something with it can be recycling the water and I think it's when you look on that 3D scale and actually say this has a function but what other two functions could it perform that's when we get the best out of a limited resource bit of land bit of area bit of grass bit of roof space and I think that will be key to the future um, there's some fantastic projects out there um, in terms of integrating with district heating schemes so there's a company called district eating for example and they have uh, glass houses linked to um, heating systems they could easily be put on rooftops of car parks or integrated into building design as well so it's that type of 3d thinking on many layers um, and I think sometimes you know tenders and things that we're bidding for don't always ask what could you do they ask us please respond to and I think actually call for ideas and um, 
sort of that type of, of, of approach could actually bring out some of the very best solutions. Um, the French are very good at integrating energy production into their roads, be it solar panel roads or, or um, uh, mobility sort of causing the generation of electricity running over roads. That's the sort of place where we've got to be. We've got to look to the rest of the world, find the best ideas and integrate it into um, the urban environment. Excellent. Now, integration was on your lips, Philip, um, utilising the urban environment around your developments to integrate. So could you pick up on uh, on that point, please? Not necessarily integration, but the question. Yes, thank you, Pat. So, yes, very conscious that we are operating on sites with red lines and most developers would work inside the red line and not care too much what's beyond it, of course, unless it impacts on sales. So we are... Uh, working with our colleagues across Ealing to look more holistically at developments. And I did mention integration and I mentioned active travel planning. And that's one of the themes in the in Ealing's green print where we're looking at the 15 minute uh, city. So we are looking at how our sites integrate with the urban fabric and how the sites can contribute to regeneration and development in a wider area, so not just within the red line of the site. And of course, all of our sites are urban because they are in an urban setting, but Ealing is very green as well. It was known as the queen of the suburbs. I think um, one of the challenges we will have in the borough is maintaining that feeling of space and openness while increasing development. So um, integration of more dense developments will be a challenge. And it's certainly one of the themes in our design guide, our development guide, dealing with density and tall buildings as one of the objectives, or two of the objectives, in fact. So there are several ways this plays. And uh, Emma is right, we should look at opportunities on multiple layers when it comes to developing uh, spaces and sites. And that is one of the themes running through our development guide is how we uh, maximize the benefit of the development, not only for the people that are moving in. So the people uh, directly impacted uh, in a sense that they are occupying, but the people around as well, and how we leverage the development to achieve some of the objectives in Ealing's green print and especially uh, climate energy. So uh, it's, it's a key theme for us and uh, one we're going to be looking at. And as I said, the development guide is an active document. It's in interim format, so it's not formally adopted, but we are using its uh, principles for all of our initial developments. And we intend to learn as we go. So any learning we get from our initial schemes will feed back into the development guide and ensure that it's uh, updated and regularly fed back into. And that, of course, involves feedback from people once they move in. So uh, not immediately, because, of course, you don't know immediately what your um, feeling is around your new home, but over time, so maybe six months in and maybe two years in and maybe five years in, uh, actively engaging with people that have moved into the properties to understand their feedback and learn any lessons we can both in terms of the property themselves and how we might benefit through better integration. Splendid. Let's go to Paul. Thank you. I, um, yeah, I think with regards to density, I think it's important that you can achieve good quality buildings and good quality, uh, quality of life for residents uh, and achieve density. Uh, I think at Greenford, we developed a very successful uh, E-type typology uh, in plan, uh, which offers two um, quite large external landscaped areas. So we've got over 26,000 square foot of um, landscape external terrace space, um, you know, so uh, a couple with achieving 379 apartments. So it was that balance that we didn't want to just, you know, deliver the maximum amount of apartments. We felt that this typology could achieve the density, but also the external space is key and is key. And we've discovered that with COVID, uh, where people without access to, to external space, um, they, they move on. Um, I think, you know, everybody wants that access to external space these days. Um, and to follow on uh, a thread from Emma um, and meshing together, I suppose, 
landscaping and infrastructure um, beneath the central square at Greenford, we've got an energy centre and a district heating network. Um, so again, we look to what can we do here to maximise this development, to maximise the land that we have. And we felt putting the energy centre um, in the ground uh, and landscaping over it just would provide the, the, the best um, use of that land uh, whilst achieving um, so many objectives, you know, high quality landscape, um, sustainable, uh, environmentally friendly um, energy. Um, so, yeah, that, uh, I think, you know, what we discovered at Greenford and what we developed um, are lessons that we are taking forward uh, on other, other schemes. Thank you very much, Richard, and then Joe. Um, I think for me, it's in terms of you know, that finite amount of space you have, it's about um, a sort of a variety of living options and different types of development that come together um, that allow so the different demographics that make up a sort of rich and diverse community to come together and exist together. And, and it provides all the different things that the community will need. So like Paul was saying there about the outdoor space, you know, you need that as part of the development. Um, but uh, the sort of investment, the long-term investment in the places that we're making, I think is going to become more and more important because we can't really do what we've done previously where we deliver something and then just leave it and say, well, you know, another management company will take care of that or somebody else will take care of that. You know, it needs to be, you know, the reason the community trusts the MO talking about works is because people are invested in it and the community is there surrounding it and you know that needs to sort of roll out more so that people are invested in the place that they are building um, and the the, sort of the financial investment is a sort of patient longer term investment um, and all that all sort of come together to give that intergenerational living that everyone is talking about now that um, kind of helps the communities thrive and it gives a space for everyone um, and it allows new forms of development that um, you know talking about Greenford the 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 built to rent blocks, the, the design of them breaks a lot of the rules of a traditional private development. Um, but you know, if you try to design them the way that a private block would be designed, you know, they wouldn't be run and managed as well as they, they are. And they can offer you the things like the outdoor spaces that the, these built to rent blocks can offer you. So we have to be open to these new forms of development that can sort of change the way people live because you know, people can't afford to buy in the way that they did before. People aren't interested in buying in the way they were before. So we have to keep up with that interest in different ways of living by providing different offerings to live in a different way. Okay, thank you. And Joe. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, to me, the, the opportunity of development shouldn't be sort of... Um, underestimated the when you make a mark on a community like that it's for you know it's for 100 years potentially for hundreds of years so i think starting with that framework um, the aspirational framework of what you're looking to achieve in that very long-term vision which um, may be a shift for some of our development partners um, and really trying to cultivate that commitment up the decision-making tree whether that is the, the public sector or the, the private sector and um, really aligning all of our values to come together to support the long-term agenda and I think um, Broadway Living is, is really doing that with the design guide um, it's really setting out a really clear framework for how we want future communities to develop out. So um, I think that's a really great start. And also just learning as we move forward and knowing that um, we can all evolve on this journey together and, and share in, in, um, in the learnings that are, that are coming out from all the work we're doing. You're on mute. Put into the mute swear box. Um, the... So one of the questions we want to come on to, which is is actually being raised by David Hutt, but it's also on the, the questions we were going to address anyway, is about the lessons from lockdown. And you started to address that to a certain extent. But, but there's a, a couple of very specific questions as well that David has also posed. Um, and I'm you know, picking up on what you've just said, Joe. Uh, this follows on very nicely. Um, how how do you market the, this retrofit to communities? Um, do you see any benefits in raising awareness uh, to the to the local communities that you're you're doing this with and to of what the the benefits of retrofit? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a huge amount of this is going to be about storytelling. Um, I can't remember which um, which sort of lead of an, uh, one of the big six energy companies said uh, that the average uh, UK resident spends something like seven minutes a year thinking about their energy. So it's not a tr it's not a top priority for us, and it's not a hugely interesting topic for most of us. Um, but we have to find a way to make it interesting and, and to tell that story. And one of the ways that our uh, climate strategy is trying to do that is by tying in what are called the co-benefits. So that's, um, you know, to think about the ways that this actually relates to health, if health is what is important to you or the way that you travel or, um, you know, the, the economic benefits or the job that you may have. So tying this, this story, this climate action story to all of the other, uh, whatever might sort of catch capture your interest. Um, and with retrofitting, I, I do think it's going to be the story about um, improving homes for health and for, um, you know, just generally, a, a lot of us are living in, in homes that are 100 years old and, and, and what a refresh of that home could, could bring to your life um, will, will be an important part of that. Um, what we're trying to do as well is get some consistency from central government around the messaging, um, because without that, we're faltering. We're sort of, you know, flailing from rung to rung with long gaps in between about the importance of this message, quite frankly. Um, and we really need a sustained 20 year effort to, to get over the line on this one. So in that case, you know, what, what you're saying is what Emma was saying as well. And it takes us to the question, uh, another question from David. And do feel free others to contribute, you know, a question. Uh, we've got 10 more minutes. Um, about, Emma, you talked about food. You know, what you're, you're, you were both talking about really is, is, is getting beyond silos in lots of, in, in developing and thinking about these places where we can solve many of societies and people's issues and desires by integrated thinking. Um, and David's asking for you to just expand a little bit about your agri-tech learning. And if you could just do that very briefly, please. So, so it's um, expand on your agri-tech learning and how you can support future communities, particularly in tight city center sites. I'm thinking there, David, that you should have a look at Brooklyn uh, Grange, which is rooftop farms in Brooklyn and Queens. But Emma, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Very briefly, I think it, it, it starts from production and it goes all the way to consumption. And from a production point of view, um, there are many spaces that can grow. There's some great companies like um, uh, Square Mile Farms that have propped up in terms of uh, localised food production. But I mean, I think we have to be very aware that you can't grow everything potentially that everybody wants in an urban area. And I think it's actually how we manage supply, how we manage deliveries to homes in the future. That's something that's come out of lockdown, but also how we manage food waste. And that could be from cafes, restaurants, people, markets in the area. And actually there's a lot of new technology and apps which allow people to food share, um, we're working with a company that is working with a black fly that eats food waste and it turns it into a fertilizer called uh, Better Origin and that comes in a container. So there are great examples of where they've done it on scale, but there are great examples where they've brought it down into urban area settings. And I think it's an education piece as well. Um, in developing worlds, 40% of the food is spoilt from the, the literally the production to getting it to market. And in modern worlds and, and, and areas like we're living, 40% of food apparently is spoilt once it gets to your fridge. So it's educating people about what they buy. And that comes into the whole buying local, regenerating the high street into local um, you know, uh, markets, etc. And it's something that I think we're going to see carrying on very soon. People have, have wanted to walk, to buy, to integrate with people. And it's reviving the high street, uh, utilising food as well. So, yeah, and I, I would put in there always has to be an element of fun. And I think you can use food to be fun. It's a very social, pleasurable experience, be it growing, picking and eating together. So that would be my takeaway. So thank you. There is a question from um, uh, a gentleman, Mr Patel. Um, saying, given that landlords may have properties across different boroughs, 
Are there plans to work with other councils to expand screens across London and maybe benefit from scales? So I think we start with Joe on that. What I really like to do, because I want to come back to the post, the lockdown learning uh, as the last point from people. If we can start with Joe, and if anybody particularly wants to come in, please do say, but we won't necessarily go to everybody. Joe. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for the question. I think, uh, I don't know if the, the person that posed the question was talking about retrofitting specifically, but that's certainly, um, this. there were seven boroughs that have come together to um, bring in the funding for the Green Homes Grant. So we're certainly looking at collaboration and, as I said a moment ago, consistency with our messaging being really important um, and, and consistency with delivery as well so that people sort of know what they're getting. Um, so yeah, that's certainly been something we've been trying to address on a, a collaborative level. And West London has a really great um, history for, for working together to, um, to look at things on a sub-regional level, whether that is a, a transport or a retrofit or um, large infrastructure uh, programs. What about on the developer side, Greystar, and on the design side, HTA? Yeah, um, it, we would like to get, yeah, work and ensure there's some, um, I suppose, um, lessons that can be carried forward uh, to other boroughs. Uh, I think, you know, built rent is still a nascent sector uh, in the UK and in, in London. So um, I know there's, there's definitely been, you know, it's come on leaps and bounds in terms of getting consistency of, of criteria. And, and it's an educational piece, I suppose, because um, it, it is so new. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely see the future being bright in that regard with uh, a lot of the boroughs, um, yeah, uh, coming together and, and open to this, this new form of housing. Right, thank you. Richard. Yeah, I suppose I would echo everything that, that Paul and Joe have said. I mean, I don't currently see a lot of uh, consistency necessarily between the, the different boroughs, um, but uh, there's no reason there shouldn't be, and given that people move between boroughs and jobs quite a lot, um, you know, there's no reason that there shouldn't be, and that consistency uh, would be a good thing. Okay. Philip and Emma, do you want to chip in on anything? You don't have to. Yes, I do. I just wanted to say lessons from lockdown, and... Uh, no, we're not, we haven't started lessons from lockdown yet. We're still on how we, how do we take this out? And it may be that might be one of the lessons from lockdown, but it just, how is there a way of, um, uh, that's because landlords go across different boroughs. Are all their plans to work with other councils to expand schemes? I think Emma wants to come in and then in a moment, come back to you, Philip. Certainly, um, we work a lot in joint venture. I know that the housing associations are looking at collaborating together. Um, they've all applied for the Green Homes Grant. I know people like Sanctuary, for example, are looking at their whole housing stock across the country. So I think there's power from the boroughs and I think there's power from the housing associations. And I think together there's a massive combined uh, force in terms of bringing down the cost of things like air source heat pumps and, and all the technology that seems quite expensive now, but, but genuinely will we'll get cheaper the more we use. Brilliant. Thanks very much. And Philip, you don't have to answer the question about collaborating across London or scaling up across London. You may want to go straight to the lockdown question because well, that's really, can, we need I to can, go. I can do both. So uh, Broadway Living is uh, involved in Penn Borough working. So we're in uh, two networks. The first is the West London Alliance of the seven boroughs in West London, which is looking at how they can cooperate to deliver more at scale. And one of the subgroup working uh, one of the sub-working groups is on modern methods, but there are others as well. And uh, I attend those meetings in my current role as Director of Housing Development, but also um, I will be attending meetings, uh, hopefully, to offer services or Broadway Living to the West London group of other boroughs. So that would be yeah. uh, part of our future plan, would be to expand our offer to beyond dealing. And the second group that I'm involved in is a new group, which is the London Local Housing Companies, because there are several set up now and we are not competing with each other because we operate within our own boroughs. So we can do a lot of collaboration and active uh, sharing of best practice, which we are doing. And there's there's two forums. There's an, uh, an informal forum, which we've set up together. And then there's a more for formal forum, Three Future of London. So, uh, yes, there's certainly 
opportunity to collaborate uh, across the piece with the local housing companies. But then on to lessons from lockdown, which was the, uh, the next point. So um, from a personal perspective, and also I think what we need to think about from the broader living perspective is uh, three or four key things. The first is design for home working. And this is a challenge for affordable housing generally because the space is usually constrained and occupation is usually very high. So we need to address that challenge. People will be working from home more, maybe not full time anymore, hopefully not, but um, there will be some element of home working. I think more local active travel will be more the norm. I think people are going to want to stay local more than they have done historically. So that would mean regeneration of local neighbourhoods and green spaces. So you've got active, healthy green spaces locally and you've got a good local neighbourhood that you can walk to or cycle to. And also when you cycle somewhere, you've got somewhere safe to leave your bike rather than it being against the lamppost and then not there when you come back. And then changing shopping habits. Uh, People may want to shop more locally as they've, as they did in uh, the gap between the lockdowns, but also people get more deliveries. So how do we facilitate people having more home deliveries and how do we encourage people to travel actively to their local neighbourhoods for their other shopping needs? So I think those are the key things we need to think about. And of course, um, how we bring those together will be a real challenge, but uh, certainly working collaboratively across the borough and across West London on those local infrastructure networks and the more regional networks will certainly help. Brilliant, thank you very much. Let's go to Richard. I think um, I'd echo a lot of what Philip said. I think the um, home working is going to be a thing and the access to quality outdoor space that um, people can enjoy and use throughout the day is going to be a big thing. So the the management and infrastructure of these places, uh, I think, will be something that I, we need to really kind of look at in, in a lot of detail to make sure that these places can function as as they were designed to um, and as they, as everyone hopes they will. Um, the the home working thing is, you know, is a question of uh, the space standards really, you know, um, and that's a conversation that you know, we'll rumble on, I'm sure, for a long time. Um, because the you know the you make the apartments less you'll get on, but um, it's again you know it sort of goes back to my previous point of having a, a range of offerings for people to you know to move about in between. So, um, the you know the benefit of the sort of built to rent model is that you know if you if you need a bigger apartment, you know, you're not tied into specifically that apartment. You're in you can move around within a block, or if uh, you know if, if it's going to be like Bristol that has multiple offerings across different boroughs, you know you can move to different spots to. Ed Sucre, you might be working or how you might be working. Great, thank you very much. So Mr. uh, Space Standards plus 10%, over to you, please, Paul. (laughs) Thanks for the intro. Um, Yeah, I'd echo a lot of uh, Philip's points uh, and Richard's. uh, And I think some of the aspects that I find quite interesting is um, I think social interaction is going to be major going forward. You know, obviously there's a lot of directives, even pre-COVID, to address loneliness in London. Um, and I think Bill's Rent is uh, is hugely beneficial in offering that amenity space and offering that forum um, for that social interaction to meet people, to become friends of people, to have that support network uh, within your building. Um, so yeah, I, I think that will, you know, with people being cooped up for much of the last year, I'm sure as we come out of, of COVID, uh, people will search that out a lot more. Thank you very much. Queen of Village Life, we've only got a 30 seconds, so please, quickly, Emma. Thank you. Uh, better locations to do Zoom calls from inside, so better lighting in homes, plug sockets <laughs> in more sensible places, a window to look out of, uh, definitely more dog poop bin places in the parks <laughs> and more benches and also water, public water space, so you can top up your recyclable water when you're out on your bike um, or walking around. So they would be my asks. Brilliant. Thank you. Storyteller Joe. I think um, just harnessing this tremendous spirit of community that we've seen really coalesce over the last year um, and making sure that we use that, as as I said, to, to tell the story of the future together, really. Fantastic. Thank you. You've told your story so beautifully, and I would like to thank you. You know, Philip, Paul, Joe, Emma, Richard, uh, for for this unpacking some of the issues, just some of the issues that we've all got to work on together. I think, you know, one of the beauties of taking having sessions like this is hopefully it will inspire people who are doing this elsewhere or thinking about doing elsewhere to have the confidence 
uh, to see what can happen when you can focus on place and and scale and and make it happen as a combination of partners that collaborate and have vision uh, that is shared. So thank you very much for letting me learn about what you're up to. It's been inspirational. And I'll now pass back to Callum. Thank you, everybody, for listening so intently. Thank you, Callum. Over to you. Thanks very much, Pat. And, uh, and thank you as well to uh, to our panel for what was a really insightful and interesting conversation. I think there's a, there's a lot of lessons uh, that I think we can all sort of take away from that. Uh, we have two more sessions taking place this afternoon, uh, which should hopefully be appearing on your screen now. Uh, taking place uh, right now, uh, we have a discussion in partnership with Primera on how global cities can drive a global recovery. Um, and then at two o'clock, uh, oh, so apologies, it is at one o'clock, uh, the Primera session, while at uh, two o'clock, uh, we have a UK Innovation Corridor webinar, which will be looking beyond buildings and placemaking for innovation. You can find out more by visiting realestatelive.co.uk or clicking the links that are appearing in the chat box now. Thank you once again uh, to our panel and to uh, to our chair as well, Pat, and to you, the audience, for, for attending. Uh, hopefully, we will see you later this week and later in the year. Thank you. Thank you.